Hey there, everybody, and welcome to Real Time, where we are live talking about film and television and everything in between. Today's guest I'm very excited to have on is somebody who is breaking the news by being an example and breaking the stereotype from what you see on TV. And that is none other than Tahira Rahman. So let's talk about her journey into the journalistic world. Let's jump right into it. Hey there, everybody. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Mustafa Talib here with Cinema King Productions. And like I said, I'm very excited with today's guest, Tahira Rahman, somebody who has broken the barriers of stereotypes to be a representative of her community on television reporting the news. So without further ado, please help me welcome Ms. Tahira Rahman. You are on my sister. Assalamualaikum. I love that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. How are you doing today? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. It's my first weekend day, so I got a lot of errands done, try to be productive and continuing that pro- productivity now with you. So That's amazing. So again, I would like to first start off by saying thank you so, so much for taking the time with your busy schedule to uh be on the show and you know hopefully inspire others who are looking to get into the uh news world and you know uh find their career and and find their calling as it were to uh be at the forefront inshallah um for anybody who is watching if y'all have any questions for myself or for tahira please leave them in the comments i'll be looking over and uh adjusting them as they come in so without further ado, let's dive right into it. Um, and quickly, uh, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself for a little bit for those who don't know you. Okay, awesome. So first of all, Mustafa, thank you so much for having me and reaching out to me in the first place. I'm humbled and I, I'm really excited to talk about this um, with you and with anyone else who's watching. But a little bit about my story is that it has been a lifelong dream of mine to become a journalist. And I never even thought, it never came to my mind at all that being a TV reporter was even in the picture, so to say for me. Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's something that, it's funny because it doesn't matter what minority group you are from, but there are certain things you think about and it just doesn't even cross your mind that you could be that thing, you know? And so Mm -hmm. that was was the thing, that was the same for me until I got to college. And I took a broadcast class and I just fell in love with it. I was I love everything about it. I love that I get to be in the field first and foremost and talk to mm-hmm. people one on one. I love that I get to do the video and the sound and people I get to tell somebody's story in their own words with picture mm-hmm. and video. So anyway, um, I decided to make that my major. And upon graduation, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. But even with the my bosses at my internships, my professors at school um, gave me a heads up and they told me that if you plan to keep your hijab on, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. They, Some of them told me, like, start in Dearborn where there's a large Muslim population or go to Al Jazeera right. because that's, you know, and I was like, why do I have to do those things? I should be able to be a reporter anywhere in America. Absolutely, um, yes. So that that was um, like my first foray into the real world of journalism. And mm-hmm. alhamdulillah, five years after that moment of graduation is when I got my on-air uh, debut and mm-hmm. lots of ups and downs in between, lots of cries, lots of du'as, lots of powerful prayers. Um, we'll that be talking ended about up, that in yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> ended up getting me here. So here we are. Now I'm in Austin as a TV reporter. That is awesome. Just a quick little technical thing. If I can have you again, just scooch over to your right, right. just so you are center. You are perfect. That's okay, great. Awesome, awesome. All right. Uh, so I guess uh, going off of your journey, you know, in, in the beginning, what, I guess, aspired you to become a news anchor in the first place? Was it that, you know, you, you saw the news and you're just like, I wish somebody was they're telling my story or somebody that, you know, I can relate to, like what, what, where did that come from? It was very similar to that, Mustafa. And I, I think a lot of people 
especially in my generation, felt the same way as I did post 9-11. So I was in mm-hmm. fifth grade. I'm dating myself now. Everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> I was in fifth grade uh, when 9-11 happened. And I clearly remember, I went to Muslim school. If anybody knows Universal School in Bridgeview, Illinois, um, mm-hmm. that's where I was going to school at the time. And we felt, we had been in that community for years and years and years. Um, mm-hmm. And we felt comfortable. We felt part of the community. But right after 9-11, we had, and I think this is the case for a lot of Muslim schools across the country, but we had uh, police officers stationed around our school because we had gotten death threats to our school telling us to go back to where we came from, telling us that we didn't belong. And so I remember as a fifth grader coming back to school and being so confused because we'd never had any, it never crossed my mind that people didn't like us. And the same thing when I went home then watching the news and like the angry Muslim, the angry Arab, and you're with us or you're against us. You look like us or you're not with us. And it was so overwhelming. And so like for everybody and especially a little kid, Mm -hmm. it was it felt very defeating to me. Like, why are people that look like me and my family and practice what we practice? We're all nice people. But why is it being portrayed that way? And I remember thinking. I wish this news lady could just say that. I wish she could just say it. And, you know, and so that was kind of my first um, eye opener into, okay, I need to figure out, like I knew long term, whatever it was going to be that I was when I grew up, it had to be something that could change perception, something that could make a difference. And I and I wanted to be the news lady. And then, or I, want, I wanted to be a lawyer. Those are my two things in my head. Like I could only be those two things. So yeah. <laughs> that's how it started. Well, that that's incredible. I mean, uh, just to, uh, I guess, relate that I was also in fifth grade when uh, unfortunately 9-11 happened. Um, but uh, okay, so I guess that, that clarifies that. And so, I mean, you felt like it, from that point on, you, you felt you had... I would almost say a responsibility to take upon yourself to to uh, pursue that, correct? Yeah, definitely. I felt like even though, how, however old you are, 10, 10, 11 years old in fifth grade, that shouldn't be something you have to think about as a kid. Mm-hmm. And it's not something that should even be in your periphery. You should just be able to live like a kid and not think about having to change the world uh, yeah. and change perceptions. And I mean, and as long as we're here in the Black Lives Matter movement, everything that's going on around us, that's what little I'm and I can't even pretend to know their experiences because they're completely different than mine. But I'm sure that in at least a small, small way is what they're feeling is Mm -hmm. at such a young age. How can I make things different? How can I be perceived and my people be perceived in the way that's most fair, like everybody else? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And and, I mean, it is unfortunate uh, just to circle around to that subject that, you know, that the younger generation who are facing what we are facing as adults right now in the same parallel timeline are thinking the same thing. But of course, it has been a much, much longer struggle for the black community in America because of what they have uh, suffered with the system that's been put in place. But let's, I guess, come back to your story. Um, What, uh, I guess, challenges or backlashes, you did touch upon it a little bit, but I mean, what have you faced uh, in your journey to becoming a reporter? And I guess, what mindset did you have to put yourself in to overcome those challenges and move past them? Yeah, that's that's a great question, especially the latter part of that. So to start, um, the challenges were many and it, And in a lot of ways, it's something that a lot of people in journalism face. Everyone knows it's a cutthroat industry. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you're especially if you want to be on TV, there are so many people. That's kind of a dime a dozen. It's like people who want to be on TV. So to start with, it's already going to be tough. Um, And then when you add to that, a Muslim woman who wears a hijab, who's not going to take it off, whether a news director or a general manager of a station likes it or not, they're giving a statement by putting me on air. For many people, especially where I first started on air in Iowa, for many people seeing the hijab is a political statement, even though it shouldn't be, it is to them. Um, And so those, I can't be naive to the fact that 
those are conversations that I'm sure they had behind closed doors, or at least was running through the general manager's mind when my application came across his, his or her desk. So that was the biggest challenge is getting those, and we call it coded language, right? No one's ever gonna say, I can't hire you because you're a Muslim woman. But right. when you get that call, one of the biggest um, upsets for me was after months of applying and feeling like your resume and your reel and your portfolio is going through a black hole, uh, mm -hmm. I had actually gotten a few callbacks and a few interviews with a TV station in Minot, North Dakota. And so if you think about how desperate I was at the time to even consider moving to Minot, North Dakota, kind of in the mm -hmm. middle of nowhere, um, but I was stoked because the news director and I had connected so well. We had mm -hmm. such great conversations and I was like, I could work here. I could be like a TV reporter and live my dream out here. Um, and she told me I was one of the top two candidates. And but a few days later, she had called me back and said, you know, I never even call people back. I just shoot them an email. But I thought this was important. Like, I wanted to let you know that you were one of the most well-spoken and best interviews that I had ever had. But we decided to go a different direction. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that just crushed me. And I, I just thought like someone actually saw my worth. Someone saw my value as a journalist and still couldn't get over that one thing. And so yeah. um, just to quickly fast forward, yeah. uh, when I actually got on air, I actually got a Facebook message from the same news director in North Dakota. And she saw my story circulating on Facebook um, and making the rounds. And she said, I am so happy to see that you never gave up on your dream. To this day, it makes me sick to my stomach that I had to turn your application down. But that de decision did not come from me. It came from men in suits above me. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of, not that you need validation, but sometimes as a minority, you start to feel crazy. Like, like you're being kind of paranoid and this isn't happening, but that confirmed yeah. it for me. And I was just like, she, you know, it, it wasn't her decision. And I really appreciated her coming back around and, and explaining that and kind of coming clean about that because now it's something I can relay, something I can, mm -hmm. you know, talk about and point to and say, hey, sometimes it just takes time. Right. And then it, like, it's also, I guess, a, a bit of closure for yourself, you know, to, to hear that from the same person, you know, that it wasn't me. It was the people above. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I mean, just being in media, like in, in all aspects, whether being in film or television, like there's always the struggle of, you know, a minority who is trying to be represented uh, or, or trying to represent their own community to tell their own stories. It's always, you know, a similar struggle. But I think... Uh, I would argue in the more recent years, uh, in terms of like, you know, the Muslim presence, it has been more prevalent because uh, all the other stories have been told and recycled forever and ever. Now it's time, you know, to have an actual equal playing field for other groups to be represented because one, it is a new story and two, a new perspective, but also most importantly, three, um, it is to change it's what most people are interested in right to understand because we are becoming a, a a culture a society of we want to understand one another better so we can thrive uh more don't you yeah agree? i think it is changing a lot and i agree with that because I think that's why we also see, I don't know which comes first, the chicken or the egg in this situation, but yeah. we see a lot of um, prominent Muslim American figures. I mean, we have mm -hmm. Ibtihaj Muhammad, we have um, yes. Ilhan Omar, we have so many people that are so visible in the spotlight in mainstream media right now um, mm -hmm. as like political activists, as just public figures and sport, you know, athletes, that yes. it makes it a little bit easier to have that conversation for a lot of people and even as muslims ourselves just have a little bit more pride and um, sense of confidence in our identity as american muslims like i think for at, right now especially is the time where we're really pushing the narrative of at least for kids you can be both there's nothing wrong with being or conflicting about being a hundred percent muslim a hundred percent american and you should never feel like that. And I think it was maybe a little bit harder. Yeah, exactly. They go hand in hand. <laughs> and, 
And I think maybe it was a little bit harder for our parents or grandparents to understand because they were the immigrants and they, yep. you know, they didn't necessarily feel that way themselves. And so their part, I'm not undermining at all, was so important. They built our massage. Vital. They built our Islamic schools. Our part is to take it further. Our part is to, to go into those areas where they didn't feel comfortable, where they didn't feel like they had the knowledge to. We mm -hmm. grow up in the American system. We have that education. We know how the system works. We know what works and what doesn't. And we know how to change it. And so it's time to pick up that mantle and, and go forward. And I think that's what a lot of American Muslims are doing right now. Absolutely. And, and I just want to acknowledge our, uh, like you just said, uh, you know, our parents, those who, who came to this country looking for, you know, better opportunity, not just for themselves, but for their children and, the, you know, their future generations and to have a presence. So you know, a big, big shout out to our, our parents uh, for making that sacrifice. And then especially those who are in the arts, who are in the creative field, uh, you know, who have supported us because, you know, typically in, in our culture, it's like, oh, go after the money. So, you know, you have the, oh, you know, I want my son or daughter to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, etc. Versus those who are actually making social changes through their art by being in the film industry, by being in the newsroom such as you and I. And, you know, I want to thank firstly my parents for pushing me and supporting me. And I'm sure your family also supported you in your endeavor. Yes, would not be here without my family. Number one supporters. My mom is the one that actually when I almost broke down, I was on the side of the road in Iowa next to cornfields. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I was just crying after my last rejection. And I told her I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, Mom, I'll just be happy with what I have. Alhamdulillah, I'm a producer in a newsroom. That's good enough. And she is the one who kicked me back up. And she said, no, you're going to get back up. You're going to go back. You're going to train yourself more. You're going to apply the next time a position opens up. And you're going to keep applying until you get it. And so, yes, 100%, I would not be here without them. And everyone knows a parent's dua for their child is one of the most powerful. So 100%, yes. I would not be here without them. We love you, Mama and Baba, always. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's uh, talk about your career, you know, in terms of like the technicalities of it. Um, when you're reporting the news, mm -hmm. how do you not let what you are reporting affect your emotions, even, like, even if it's like just a heartbreaking story to tell? That is a hard one. And it's something actually, it's, a very big conversation right now um, because we, just like everyone else, have been pummeled for the last few months, right? First, we had the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we've been reporting day in and day out about that. And then it's been nonstop. And then we have this national, if not worldwide movement. Global. Global, Global movement. yes. With Black Lives Matter, and it's just, and, and it's not, and it's obviously not just George Floyd, right? We know of all no. these stories, and we're kind of right back here again every few years, but at mm -hmm. least for me and journalists my age, this is our first time, you mm -hmm. know, we're, we weren't around for the Rodney King riots, so like this is yeah. our first time, we don't know necessarily how to process these emotions and report at the same time, so it's been a big conversation, and actually we just got a uh, an email from our next star CEO, the president of our entire company who owns like 400 plus stations around the country. Mm -hmm. um, and he and he said the same thing. He's like, I understand it's emotional and mentally draining for all of you. Lean on your older coworkers who've been through this, like get some advice from them. And I think for, for me at least what I found is even over the last few years reporting because in Iowa, we had a lot of like unfortunate, unfortunate stories we had to cover. Just we were along the Mississippi and we had like child drownings. And you just hear like the screams of the parents all night as they look for their kids in the water. And it's just yeah. sometimes and I was like first on the scene when this like freak accident happened on the 4th of July and people were crushed by branches like like a tree yeah. that fell over on them. And so it's a lot of these like scenes that you think about especially as journalists, you're first on the scenes, you're the first draft of history, as they say. Um, but a lot of times other people and even yourself, you're not thinking about how to take care of yourself. You're just thinking, I got to get there. I got to do this. I got to get the word out. I got to fact check. 
and then put it online and then do the same thing again the next day. So for me, what I found is that it's important for me to disconnect. Like I, it's, it's so hard because my phone right now is even just like flashing every second mm-hmm. with alerts. But at a certain point of the night after Maghrib, I pray and then I just put my phone upside down in the room and I leave it. And I just like, I try to maybe like read some Quran or like watch a lecture or even if I just watch a comedy show, like just Mm -hmm. not think about it until the next morning because then it's just nonstop again. So that's one of the things. And another thing, honestly, and I saw this post from another journalist that I think I really agree with. um, And it's a, a picture of her as a journalist. She's just sitting down on the steps crying. And the story was that she was covering one of the protests in her area and they started praying and she got up to take a picture and then it just the words hit her. And so she sat down and she just took it in and started crying. And for me, I just that I could really relate because when I was covering the protest last Sunday and I'm going to again on um, this Sunday, inshallah, but mm-hmm. there were moments where I just felt like a wave come over me, but I had to push it down. I was like, nope, I can't. I can't. I got to keep going. And when she, or her caption, she said, sometimes you just have to feel it. Like you can't hold it in. You're human. Mm-hmm. And repressing it sometimes can be more damaging down the road. She was like, just let it go. And I think like, it's hard for us to admit that as journalists, because we're type A, we like to do everything perfect and be perfect. And yeah, but sometimes I think you have to be human. And so I'm still learning that myself, Mustafa. I don't know what the perfect answer is, but I think it has to do a little bit with moderation, as is the case in a lot of things with our religion, even. Right. Balance. Everything is, is always going to be in balance, you know. Um, so I guess moving on from that, uh, that was a great answer, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, with the birth of social media, so we're talking, you know, early 2000s and the like, everybody kind of became a journalist to a degree, yeah. right? They all started acquiring these types of skills of research and thoroughness. Um, but at the same time, uh, because of that, a lot of misinformation gets put on the forefront. So as an actual journalist yourself, how do you make sure that you are on the forefront of a story and that it is 100% true? Well, that goes back to your training and your schooling and even being in the right environment. So for us, and I've learned a lot even since I first started uh, Mm -hmm. journalism. And that, that's, I think also a key point to remember going forward is that there's always room for improvement. There's always room for, for growth. And that was one of the biggest things I was looking for in my move. And so from Iowa to, um, Austin now, my only requirement was one, I am in a newsroom that is, um, welcoming. And then Mm -hmm. also the second thing was I need to be in a newsroom where they are just excellent at what they do. I need to I need to be excellent and I can't be excellent if I'm not learning from the best. Surround so surround yourself with like-minded individuals. Exactly. And so that is um part of what has like helped me grow and even the different the sl- the slight nuances in reporting like make the biggest difference. So mm-hmm. one of the things about at least being a TV reporter is that um, the deadlines are very quick. And so you only have until like we end our morning meeting, let's say at 10 a.m. And then for it's from nine to 10. And then I have to turn my story in time for the 5 p.m. newscast, which means it has to be done by four. So between that time, not only have you, uh, you've pitched your story and sometimes it gets approved, sometimes it doesn't, you have to keep looking for something better, but you have to flush out all your facts. You have to double check, cross check with other people. So if somebody tells you, um, yeah, I, I went to this market and um, I saw this guy get arrested or I was really scared or whatever and like I almost got mugged. You can't take that at face value. So you got to call a police department. Hey, did this person file a police report? Can I get a copy of the police report? What's the status of the investigation? And even just every small thing you have to double check. And, you know, it's something that a lot of journalists 
it, it doesn't, it's not as easy as it sounds. Sometimes you just mm-hmm. get swept up in the deadlines and then, um, and I've, I've been, I fell victim to that before. And then my, my manager calls me right before deadline and say, Hey, did you, who did you check this with? Just making sure. And I'm like, actually, that's a good question. I didn't check that one piece of information in my entire story. Yeah. So then you got to go back. So it's, it's a lot of double checking and fact checking in that sense. And I think that's what gets missed a lot of times on social media is mm. the fact that people will take the word of one person or one side or one source and not cross check mm. it with another. And I'm even seeing that now when like all these posts that you might have seen it on my Instagram lately because mm-hmm. I got very irritated. But when they say, yes. oh, you won't see this on me on the media, the media won't show you that. But a right. lot of times the posts that they're showing are taken from the media. And actually the White House did that like just this past week with one of my friends, um, the station that she works for in Florida, it was actually a video of a white officer and a black protester hugging. Mm -hmm. And in the white house press briefing, they said that the media won't show stuff like this. And my friend, um, who works for the station in Miami, she said, my coworker took this video and posted it on our station Twitter. Like this is from the media. So, right. so it's, it's stuff like that. It's like everyone kind of in, that's the way social media works is it's fast. It's a tidal wave. It just gets swept yes. up and recycled and pushed forward. And a lot of times people don't stop to think and double question and go back to the source. So I feel yeah. like that's the biggest point of difference, hopefully between a journalist or at least a good journalist and Mm -hmm. a social media journalist or news source. Right. So I guess going off of that, how do you avoid, I guess, you know, the, the, uh, what is now taboo, I think the yellow journalism. And I, that's a good question. And so you're, you mean like, do you mean like like mudslinging? Right. So let's, let's first define what is yellow journalism. This is like an old term. Yeah. And and do you mean like mudslinging and like kind of gotcha journalism? Yes. Okay. And so, yeah, that's a good question because a lot of, on the other side of things, people who aren't journalists, that's what they worry about. And that's what they mm-hmm. kind of, and I actually, I, I ran into that. I run into that a lot. That's my husband. He's coming in. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's not in the frame. He's all good. No. He's clear. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, So, so yeah, so I actually, that is a good question because that's something we come across. Um, Mm -hmm. And even I had to sit down with my manager and um, some city members, some city officials in my area here, because we had to talk about that because they were, they would, it seemed like they would block me from interviews because they were scared Mm -hmm. that I would say that I wanted to interview them about one thing, but then I would pop up with questions about something else or like secretly record them doing something and air it everywhere. And there are people who still do that, I'm Mm -hmm. sure. Um, And that's where the fear comes from. But I think one of the things you learn very quickly as a journalist is not only having integrity, but being able to keep your sources. And that Mm -hmm. is like huge because... Yeah, you can you can do good pieces and I, and I and and question power and authority mm-hmm. like you should as a journalist. That's your job. But there's right. also a way to do it respectfully, and mm-hmm. in and be able to do it in a way where you're not uh, being malicious. And this is something actually the mayor of Kyle, um, who is it's like a small town outside of Austin. He had told me that too. And he was just like, I appreciate you always being respectful because I will ask him the tough questions. One time he texted me because he saw one of my stories and he said, he was like, I had all the, it was like messages long, like in response to my story. And I said, Mayor, I understand what you're saying, but these people still have a valid grievance against you or your policy. And he said, yeah, I, I understand that. I understand you had to do what you had to do. It just sucks. And I was like, yeah, yeah. but that's a part of also being a, a figure, an authoritative figure is that you will get questions and you will get pushback. And our job is to make sure that those voices are heard. Mm-hmm. Um, so and I told him, I was like, I, remember, I also gave you a chance to respond. He said, yeah, I know. So yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the way to do it is. Um, I, I don't I don't ever think yellow journalism, mudslinging, gotcha journalism is productive in the in the long run 
right. for the goal of the public safety, public information, and even as a journalist, keeping mm -hmm. your integrity and your sources going forward. Beautifully said. Thank you for clarifying. And, you know, we need more people like you who are honest about telling the truth when you Inshallah. have a, a platform. Inshallah, yes. Inshallah. It, is a, it is a big responsibility and you're carrying it beautifully, so kudos to you. Inshallah. I try. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess uh, that kind of did answer my next question, which was about, you know, fact checking everything and, you know, making sure that it is uh, correct. Is there any instance where, I guess, in the world of social media, you know, you want to have, you know, the clickbaity type of title, a uh, headline, just to grab the people's attention, to pay attention to a story. Has that ever come across your radar, you know, in, in your own uh, uh, reporting or, you know, have you had to call it out when it was misused? Um, actually, yes. And not, not for my own. For, I think there is a definite line that we have to straddle as journalists these days uh, between what you said, like a clickbaity headline uh, and one that's engaging. Like you, you do want people to click on your story. Uh, and a lot of times it's still the case where people will click on the story with the mo more catchy headline. Mm -hmm. um, marketing. But yeah, exactly. That's like marketing 101. Um, but I, I'm, like I said, very fortunate to be in a newsroom where they are mm -hmm. very aware of that themselves. And we constantly are having discussions in the newsroom about um, even some of the push alerts that you'll send to people's phones and making sure that it's not misleading and mm -hmm. making sure that it is engaging, but it also is informative, you know? And so that's, and that's also, uh, it's not a one size fits all answer. It's case by case basis. Everything has to be looked at. And so for me, and this actually ties into kind of, um, rhetoric that could be harmful to different demographics and so when i first got here i got here actually in austin in september so i'm one of the newer uh, members of the team and one of our stories by one of my coworkers actually was at an islamic school here one of their teachers was caught on video um, forcing students to eat soap because they did something wrong and so I know. And then, of course, like I'm the one Muslim in the newsroom and I'm like, gosh, like, <laughs> um, why? I know, why? <laughs> um, and so and I actually had I have a friend, one of my first friends when I moved to Austin, I met her at the masjid. Um, she was a receptionist there. So she worked there and she was my source. So I was like, hey, like, Hanima, can you like confirm this? Like, this is the video we got from a parent. I just want to make sure that we're doing this responsibly, obviously, like we're going to have to say something about it. Yes. Um, and so anyway, I think the story turned out fine, but afterwards that night when I was done with my own story and looking on our website, I saw the headline and it said something along the lines of like Muslim school teacher, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I, and I, and then I debated the, here's the thing too. And you know, this Mustafa, but, mm -hmm. and every minority knows this, you hesitate sometimes. I'm like, how does if to whether you should speak out and how to do it right mm -hmm. because you don't want to seem like the sensitive or angry person but Hyper sensitive world that we live in yes. yes but then at the same time it is your job to call it out yes. no one else is going to do it mm -hmm. so what I, I sent an email to my manager only her not the reporter and i just said hey I could be overthinking this, but honestly, when I saw that headline, I think it's mis misleading because it doesn't matter if it's a Muslim teacher or not. It just matters that it's a teacher who was doing this to a student. Um, and so I think we should say a private school versus a Muslim school. I feel like that would be more descriptive. And I pose the question of or the situation of if this were a Catholic school, would we say it was a Catholic teacher? We would just say it was a teacher. And so she responded and she said, you're 100 percent right. I'm copying the web, web team here to make sure they correct it and et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. um, so I feel like and, and I was talking to somebody else about this the other day, day, too, where and he the reporter himself apologized. And I was talking to somebody about this and saying that it doesn't necessarily come from a bad place. I think no. it's so ingrained in society 
-hmm. to call out those details even when they're not relevant and people don't understand. If you're, for example, from a white community, you don't understand necessarily how even like a small word or a small descriptor can add to the negative stereotype that yep. other people already have. How much it can hurt, one word can hurt an entire community, an entire demographic. That's how it adds up. That's how the narrative becomes stacked against you. Mm -hmm. And so just by knowing that, I think that's why even the simplicity of having representation in a newsroom is such a big deal. Because you can read something from your perspective, from your worldview as a Muslim, and you can take something out of an, one news article, something completely different than your neighbor next door. It's just mm -hmm. based on your personal experience. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're a good person or they're a good person or bad person. Right. It's just the way that you've experienced things. And so if someone hasn't, if a, if a white man hasn't experienced that, has never thought that, hey, if I say this word, people might think badly of all white men, like, then he's not going to know at all to even have that on his radar. So um, I think that that's one example of yes. uh, how a headline can, you know, it was meant to, to get clicks and be engaging, but it was just done in, in the wrong way at that time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for sharing that insightful uh, story. Um, just to quickly wrap up, what uh, advice do you have with anybody who is looking to enter the journalistic world, you know, the newsroom? What type of, I guess, um, what would you say to anybody who is looking to join, you know, a, a news team? Um, first of all, yes, do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great endeavor. And I think that it, it's taking so many forms now. As you know, Mustafa, you're on YouTube. I mean, that's yeah. like as big of a resource as if not becoming more of a wider audience than TV mm -hmm. audiences are. So I feel like there are so many ways to go about it now that you shouldn't feel limited at all. Like even if you have to, even if your parents are still very much on your back about being a doctor, a lawyer, engineer, whatever. Reserved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even if that's the case, I would encourage you to still um, do work outside of that freelance, you know, write articles here and there if you can. And mm -hmm. even if you can do video stuff or um, live interviews like you're doing, I feel like it's it's so important to just have your voice out there. And I would encourage you to do that in any way that is most convenient or most applicable to your life. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it is still especially important to go that traditional route um, if you can and be in a newsroom because that is still and like by all means if you can get a netflix series that's awesome like do that for sure one day <laughs> inshallah me too inshallah. Right. um but but you know i think it's still important and worth it because a lot of the stuff that like we said circulates on social media is still mm -hmm. taken from newscasts it's still yes. taken from TV. And I think if you are able to shape that narrative inside newsrooms, and even if you're a producer, producers have so much power. And I know that because I was a producer before this. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one of the terrorist incidents that we covered when I was a producer. And we just kept, for some reason, all the scripts that were coming down to us from the network, the national news outlets, mm -hmm. kept talking about how this person, how the suspect had recently traveled to Afghanistan. And I was like, that has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> I was like, mm -hmm. literally, I went to India like three years ago. That doesn't make me any more prone to terrorism right. than anyone else. Neither does it's going to, to a fit masjid. The narrative. It's to exactly. fit the narrative that's been established by other people that are talking about us. Exactly. And, it, and it's like, or this person went to the mosque five times a day. And I was like, that has literally nothing to do with anything because people go to oh my church God, he's a devout all the Muslim. time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so when I was a producer, I would take that part out of my script. It was my show. I had that. I had mm. that power. And so 
I think even little things like that, people don't know what producers do. People still you, like would ask me, you know, oh, so yeah. what do you, what do you do actually? Uh, but you hold a lot of power. You write every single thing that goes into the show that the anchors say that comes out of their mouth. You have final approval of what the reporters write. So any um, uh, presence that you can establish in the newsroom, and whether that be TV or newspaper or digital, I think is, it goes so far. And you may not get the recognition. People may not know. But you can make such a huge difference. So I really encourage them to still, if they can, go that route. Thank you so much, Tahira. And just lastly, before we let you go, could you just give us your sign off from television? <laughs> you know it was coming. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, um, I, I still anglicize my name for the for the anchor. So gotcha. You're not gonna get the Tahira Rahman version. You're gonna get the TV version, which gotcha. is reporting live in Austin, Tahira Rahman, KXAN News. <laughs> and with that, thank you again, Tahira, for joining us on Real Time. And I will get back to you in just a moment. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Alrighty, y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed this live stream of Real Time, where we are live talking about film and television and everything in between. If y'all enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Make sure you hit that post notification down below so you are notified when we go live again. This is Mustafa Tadeb with Cinema King Productions signing off, and I will see y'all in the next one. Peace out.